Hey guys, we'll get started. Hope you had a good weekend. Yeah, so um, I went ahead and put in your attendance points. So it looks like basically everybody got full credit for last week. The most people, maybe a couple of people that hadn't been here didn't, but everybody else had done the course agreement quiz 1.1, 1.2, and 1.3 with a 90 or better. So uh, this week, we're just going to finish up chapter one. So we got, we'll do 1.4 today, and then 1.4, or no, 1.5 on uh, Thursday. Okay. Yeah, so today, guys, this is going to be on division, okay, division of whole numbers. And so with division, there's actually three, well, four different ways that you can denote division. Okay, you can write it using this symbol. So this and, and all four cases right here mean the exact same thing. 12 divided by three. This also means 12 divided by three. Whatever is getting divided ends up being inside this box. And you can also write it as a fraction. That's really all a fraction is, is a division problem. So 12 divided by three. And then you can use this slash right here. So these all say the same thing. Okay, so you can see it presented in different ways. And then just a little bit of terminology. Uh, I think we mentioned this last class. The result of a division product or a division problem is called a quotient. Okay, just like the multiplication, we call that a product. Uh, with subtraction, that's a difference. With addition, that's a sum. So with division, the result's called a quotient. And then the two things that are involved, whatever's getting divided is called the dividend. So 12 is getting divided by 3, so 12 is the dividend, and whatever is doing the dividing, which in this case 3, is called the divisor. Okay, so the divisor actually does the divide. Uh, and then there's a couple properties with division. If you look, let's see, division by 0. Okay, so for example, if I had, let's say, 10, 10 divided by 0, is that going to have an answer? It won't be 0. It, it won't have an answer. That's right. Okay, because we say that division by 0 is undefined. You think about it this way. If you're dividing 10 by 0, you think, how many times will 0 go into 10? Well, if 0 has no value, it would go infinitely many times, right? You just divide into 10 over and over again. So some people say division by 0 is, you could say, infinity, but infinity is not a number, okay? So it's just a concept. So in other words, the thing you got to remember here is you cannot divide by zero. That's that we say that's an undefined operation. Okay. Now the second case, uh, you can divide zero by some non-zero number. So, for example. If we had zero divided by 10, that would be zero, okay? Because you just basically say, you're basically saying, how many times does 10 go into zero? Well, it doesn't go, it goes zero times, okay? So zero divided by some other number is zero, but, you, but some other number divided by zero doesn't exist or is not defined. So this would be zero. So those are kind of the two cases uh, that you guys got to be aware of. Now, the rest of this, we're just going to kind of review over what's called long division. So this is what some people maybe get a little rusty with, forget some of the details. So here, here's an example. You can't really see it very well, uh, but we're going to work out some of these below. 
Now, when you're doing long division, guys, whenever you need to know the remainder, you've got to do it by hand. The calculator won't tell you the remainder. The calculator will give you a decimal, and that decimal is not the same as a remainder. The decimal is actually the fraction of the next whole, okay? So it's not the same thing. All right, so let's look at some of these. So in this first example, we got 92 divided by eight. So 92 is what we call the dividend. It's what's getting divided. And then eight is doing the, divi doing the dividing. So we call it the divisor. And so when you do the long division, you're gonna set it up like this. Okay, you can kind of draw that little division box. You're always gonna put the dividend inside the box. So 92 in this case. It's not necessarily the bigger number. Some people think the bigger number goes in that box. No, that's not true. You gotta look at this order, it's whatever comes first, okay? If this were backwards, the eight would go inside the box. And then we'd end up getting a decimal if we did the long division. We'll see that later on. And then the divisor eight is gonna come over here on the outside. So this is kind of the way you set it up. And then guys, basically, you're gonna to try to take this eight and divide it into this number, but you're not gonna to try to divide it into the entire number at once, because if you know what that answer is, you wouldn't be trying to do this long division. So you're gonna to try to divide it into one digit at a time. So the first thing we're gonna do is try to divide the eight into the nine. And so you just say, well, how many times will eight go into nine? Exactly, good, Kevin one time without going over, okay? So what we do is we're gonna put a one right on top of the nine. So it, it sort of matters, I guess, where you put the one. I wouldn't put the one over the two. And then what you do, once you've got the one up there, you're gonna multiply back through. So you're gonna take this one and multiply it by the divisor, which is an eight. So you say one times eight is eight. And you're gonna put that eight directly underneath the nine. And then you're gonna subtract. And guys, these steps will continue over and over and over. It's the same algorithm. So nine minus eight is just one. So after you subtract, you bring down the next digit. So the next digit in 92 is two. So I'm gonna drop down that two. So now that one becomes 12. And so we just repeat the process. Now we're gonna to try to divide the eight into the 12. We're gonna see how many times. So one again, right? So you're gonna put another one on top. And then you're gonna multiply back through again. Take this one, multiply it to the eight again, and you'll get eight and that goes under the 12 and you're gonna subtract. So this process would just repeat. And so, 12 minus eight, you know, we could borrow if we needed to, but I think you guys know that's gonna be four. And so when there's no more digits to bring down, we're done, okay? We already brought the two down, there's nothing else, so we're finished. So the quotient is gonna be whatever number is up here, 11. And what you have down here, this is gonna be called the remainder. This is what's left over. So this just basically means that Eight goes into 92, 11 whole times, and you have a remainder of four, okay? So the quotient's 11, and four is the remainder. Usually I just put a capital R next to the four. Now let me show you, if I tried to do this in the calculator, I'll say, Ninety-two. Remember, you put the ninety-two first. You divide it by eight. You get eleven point eleven point five. Okay, so this five is not the remainder. This just means it's half of that next whole. So if you had four more, then eight would go into ninety-two one more time for a total of twelve times. Okay. So 
All right, uh, the second one. What do you guys think this one's going to be? Undefined. Because in this case, we're trying to divide by zero, and that, that's not possible. Okay? Now, if the order was switched, it would be zero. You can, you can even try this in the calculator. If I put in here 36 divided by zero, calculator is going to give me an error. It says division by zero. Okay. So, all right. So I'm just going to say this is an undefined operation. It doesn't even really give us an answer because it has no meaning. All right. Number three. In this case, it's written as a fraction, but we know this is still division. 147 divided by seven. Okay, so the 147 is the dividend and the seven is the divisor. So I'm gonna set it up the same way. 147 goes in the box and then the seven, which is the divisor is gonna go on the outside. And we'll do it the same way. Now, what you could do is you could say, well, seven goes into one zero times, you could put a zero on top, but that's not gonna be necessary. If you have a zero on top in front of the number, that's not going to change the value of the number. So usually, you know, if the seven won't go into the one, then you look at two digits, the first two digits, and see if the seven will go into 14. And it does, doesn't it? Seven will go into 14 two times. Good. Exactly. So we'll put a two on top. And I'm going to put it on top of the four, sort of at the end of the 14. And then just like the previous example, we're going to multiply back through. So we'll say two times seven is 14. So put that underneath. Now you've got to subtract again. 14 minus 14 is zero. You always bring down the next digit, which is seven. So now we got seven. So now we've got to divide seven into seven. And how many times will that go? Good. Just one time, so put a one on top. And when I multiply back through now, this one times seven gives us another seven. And when we subtract, we get zero. And we're finished because there's no more digits to bring down. So does this one have a remainder? Doesn't. We got a number down there, but zero represents nothing, right? Or no remainder. So we could say that seven divides into 147 evenly. There's nothing left over. It goes 21 times. You could check this. You could say 21 times seven, and it'll give you 147. Okay, what about number four? Same thing with this one. 364 divided by seven. Well, we know seven's not going to go into three. So now I'm going to look at 36. Seven into 36. How many times would that go? Good, five. So put the five above the six and we'll multiply back through. Five times, five times seven is going to be 35. We'll subtract again. 36 minus 35 is one. We'll bring down that last digit, which is a four. And the seven will divide into the 14. It's going to go an even two times. And when we multiply back, back through, this two times seven is 14. And so we, we end up with, with no remainder again. So 52 with no remainder. Now in your homework, guys, if the computer asks for a remainder, you got to put in a zero. guys okay on those? Check some more. All right, let, let's do these last two and then we'll move on. Okay, so here we've got 1,724 divided by 27. All right, so this is where it gets a little more complicated. You might have to refer to a calculator. Um, so we're dividing 27 you know, 27 is not going to go into one. 
So we'll look at the next two digits, 17. Will 27 go into 17? No. So then we've got to look at the next three digits. 27 into 172. Yeah. So let's try six. Now, sometimes you may not be sure. So you would just guess and check. You might try five, multiply back through. Uh, if you end up after subtracting, if your number is bigger than 27, that means you could have gone at least one higher, okay? But in this case, I think it is gonna be six. And I'm gonna put that six over the two. We'll multiply back, to, back through this. Six times 27, or you could do it like this. Six times 20 would be 120, and six times seven is 42. So 120 plus 42, be 162, okay? And then we'll subtract again. So 172 minus 62 is an even 10. And we got to drop down the last digit, which is a four. So now we're going to divide the 27 into the 104. What do you guys, how many times? Three? We can try that. I think four might be too much. So we'll multiply three to the 27. This, you know, you might have to do this aside. So three times seven is 21, carry the two. You're gonna get, you know, two times three is six, plus that two gives us 81. So we'll put an 81 under here. And when we subtract again, guys, I'm not going to go through the subtraction again because you, you're going to have to borrow, basically. But uh, 104 minus 81 is 23. Now, there's no more numbers to bring down. So if this number is smaller than this number, you're good. Okay. Now, if this number down here has been bigger than 27, then that means I need to bump that up. That, that would have meant that 27 could have gone into 104 more than three times. So you might have to try four or five. But in this case, we're good. Our remainder has always got to be smaller uh, than the divisor. Okay, so the quotient is, is 63, and then the remainder is 23. And you could check this. If you wanted to check it, you would multiply the 63 to the 27, and then you would add in the remainder. So let me, let me do this real quick just to show you. So I'm going to say 63 times 27. That gets us most of the way there. But then when we add in that remainder, which is 23, that takes us all the way to that dividend, 1,724. You guys good? I okay, will do this next one. 2016 divided by 21. Okay, so again, you know, twenty one is not going to go into two. It's not going to go into twenty, but it will go into two hundred one. So we got to see how many times. What do you guys think? Nine? Yeah, I think so. So I'm going to put a nine up there. And we'll multiply back through nine times 21 will be 189. And if we subtract 201 minus 189 is 12. You know, if you do all the borrowing and stuff. Now I'll bring down my next digit, which is a six. So now we're gonna divide 21 into 126. Okay, we'll try six. 
six times 21 is exactly 126. So in this case, we're not gonna get a remainder again. So 21 is gonna go into 2016 evenly, 96 times. You guys have any questions on the division? Okay. All right, so just remember, you know, some of these you may not be able to do with your calculator. All right, so we're gonna talk about something else. Uh, prime number, anyone heard of that? So a prime number, guys, is basically just a number that's really not divisible by anything else, okay? Really, nothing, nothing will divide into it other than the same number and the number one, because one will go into anything. So these are a few examples of prime numbers. Two, three, five, seven, 11, et cetera, 13. This list goes on forever, by the way. Okay? Those numbers have no divisors or no, well, we also call them factors other than the number itself and one, okay? So that's why they're called prime numbers. Now, if a number is not prime, then it's called composite. So there's two types of whole numbers. They're either prime or they're composite. So a composite number, that just means that there are some numbers that will divide into it. So for example, four, what would go into four? Exactly. Two goes into four. Uh, six, two and three will both go into six, won't they? Okay. And then eight, two goes into eight, four goes into eight, nine is composite because three will go into nine. Um, and then you guys can, can look at the rest of those. There's probably, in a sense, more composite numbers than there are prime numbers. All right, now we want to talk about factors. I think I mentioned this last class. Factors, factors are basically the building blocks of these numbers. So a second ago for six, I said two and three go into six. What that means is two and three are factors of six, meaning that if you multiply those two numbers together, you will get six, okay? So every single number has some factors. The factors are basically the pieces that when you multiply them together will give you the number. So 10, for example, two times five would be the factors of 10. Also one and 10 are factors of 10, right? So when you multiply those, you get 10 as well. So what we wanna do is we wanna do something called finding the prime factorization of a number. So what does this mean? Well, it means not only finding the numbers that when multiplied, give us the number we're looking for, but we want those factors to be prime numbers. So for 16, I don't wanna use four times four because four is not a prime number. I wanna use two times two times two times two because two is a prime number. And if you multiply all those twos together, you'll get 16. So we talk about the prime factorization, we're basically saying, what prime numbers do we need to multiply to get this number, okay? And so one of the easiest ways to figure this out, guys, is by doing what's called a factor tree, or making a factor tree. So you may remember having done this when you were younger. And this is kind of what it looks like. You're breaking these numbers down. Now, like for 80, you're trying to think, well, what times what would give me 80? Well, 20 times four, and then you focus on the 20 and the four. You try to factor those or break them down. So for the 20, you say, what times what would give me 20? Well, four times five. Okay, and you just keep going. So each piece you can think about as being sort of a branch. So you keep going until all you have at the end of those branches are prime numbers. You don't want any composite numbers. So I'm going to try to illustrate this.
Notice with 80, though, let me, let me zoom in just a little bit. Look at 80. There's two different factor trees here, but the prime factors ended up being all the same. Two to the fourth power, what does that mean? Exactly, it means four factors of two. So we get the same prime factorization in each of these trees, even though we didn't use the same factors. Here we said 20 times four, and over here we said eight times 10. Okay, so the point here is that when you're starting off a factor tree, it doesn't matter what two numbers you choose, as long as when they multiply, they give you that original number. Okay, so, you know, we could do a big number and we might all have different factor trees but our prime factors at the end should all be the same. All right, so. It says for each of the following whole numbers, we're gonna list all of its factors and then write it as a product of its prime factors. Okay, so 16. Yeah, that would be the pr prime factorization. What would all the factors be, though? Eight. Good. One and 16, yeah. Yeah, we can put one on here. And we can also put 16. Okay. When it just asks for the factors, it's just asking for what numbers will go into 16 evenly. Now, when it asks for the prime factorization, that's when we have to break it down such that the factors are only prime numbers. So that's when we're going to use a factor tree. All right, so to find the prime factors, I'm going to start with 16. I'm going to draw two branches off of it. So what you're going to do is you just think, what times what will give me 16? Four times four, sure. You could also use two times eight. Now, at the ends of these branches, if these are composite numbers, you got to keep breaking them down. You only stop when they end up being prime numbers. Well, four is a composite number, so I'm going to keep breaking those down which means from each of those fours, I'm gonna draw two more branches. Okay, so from this first four, what would the factors be? Good, two times two, that's right. And two, since it is a prime number, I'm gonna go ahead and circle it because this is gonna be part of the prime factorization of 16. And then you're gonna do the same thing with the second four, draw two more branches, well, it's gonna factor the same way, two times two. And those are both prime numbers. Okay, so I'll circle those. So guys, as you come across these prime numbers, go ahead and circle them because that's what you gotta use in your final prime factorization. So I'm finished, I can't break down these two, these twos, they're prime numbers. So what you do to write the prime factorization, you can do it a couple of ways. You can say two times two times two times two. You can list all four of those twos, or you can use exponential notation, which basically means you just count up the factors that you have. You have four twos, so you can write this as two to the fourth power. Okay, so that four, this is what we call an exponent. So, I think the, uh, the computer will take either one of those two answers. Because they're both correct. You guys have any questions? What about 37? For our numbers you're talking about. Yeah, 37 is a prime number, guys. So, you know, if we had to list the factors of 37, they're just going to be 1 and 37 because 37 is a prime number. And these two factors would be 
you know, the prime factorization as well. Okay. There are no other factors of 37. Let's do one more. I mean, let me make up one. Uh, let's do this one. 1,125. We'll just try to find the prime factorization. So I'm going to draw two branches. So on one like this, you know, it's a little more difficult to try to figure out, well, what times what will give me 1,125. So there's sort of some tips or some tricks that you can use. If a number ends in five, it's divisible by five. That means that five is a factor, okay? So I know one of my factors is, is going to be five. How could I find the other factor? Good. You would literally divide 1,125 by five, and that'll tell you what that other factor is. So you could even use your calculator for this. So 1,125 divided by five, we get 225. So this means that five times 225 uh, will give us 1,125. Now I'm going to go ahead and circle that first five because it's a prime number. But the 225, I think, is composite, which means we can factor it further. Well, we can use that same trick, right? Because it ends in five. So we can say five times something will give us 225. Any ideas what it is? Good. It is going to be 45. And we'll circle that second five because it's a prime factor. And now with the 45 guys, I think we can do this one. It's going to be five times nine. We get another five. And then nine is composite. So you got to break down the nine into three times three. And those threes are our prime numbers. So now we've got all, we found all the prime factors of 1,125. So the prime factorization would be those three factors of five times those two factors of three. Or if we want to write this using exponential notation, since we have three factors of five, we can write this as five to the third power times, and we have two factors of three, so we could write that as three to the second. When something is raised to the third and second power, there's a shortcut way of saying that. Does anybody know the way you say it? So instead of saying five to the third power, there's another way I can say that. Yeah, there you go, five cubed. So anything that's raised to a power of three is said to be cubed. And then anything that's raised to a power of two is said to be squared. So you can read this five cubed times three squared. And that terminology, guys, comes from finding the area of a square. How do you find the area of a square? Exactly, you multiply the length times the width. And if it's a square, the length and the width are the same. So you end up with the same number times itself. So like four times four or four to the second power. So that's where that term comes from. And then cubed comes from finding the volume of a cube. The volume though, three dimensional. It's the length times the width times the depth. But you end up multiplying the same number three times. So like four times four times four. So they say that it's four cubed. Okay, so that's where that terminology comes from.
Okay, do you guys have any, any other questions on 1.4? Okay. All right, well, that's basically all I had planned for us today.